In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of equivalence relations by talking about the equivalency classes that an equivalence relation defines. So again, let's recall some definitions. A relation between a set A and a set B is simply a subset of the Cartesian product A cross B. It's a set of ordered pairs where the first element is from A and the second element is from B. If the two sets are the same, so if A is equal to B and R is just a subset of A cross A, then we say that the relation is a relation on A. We usually write that A is related to B as A, R, B instead of saying that the ordered pair A comma B is an element of the relation. Okay? And when we write A, R, B, we read it as A is related to B. Uh, that's the common practice with relations such as less than or equal, and it's the practice that will continue when we're talking about equivalence relations and other relations. So some properties of relations. If R is a relation on a set A, we say the relation is reflexive when for all A in the set big A, A is related to A. We say the relation is symmetric if whenever A is related to B, then B is related to A. And we say a relation is transitive if whenever A is related to B and B is related to C, then A is related to C. And finally, a relation is called an equivalence relation if it has all three of these properties, if it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Now, when we have an equivalence relation, we can define an equivalence class for every element of the set the equivalence relation is defined on. So let's let A be a set with an equivalence relation. For any set, for any element A in the set big A, the equivalence class of A is a set of all X in A so that X is related to A. Okay? So an equivalence class of an element in the set A is a set of all things related to that element. All right? Now, equivalence classes have some very nice properties. Um, let's talk about this equivalence relation that we've seen before, where we define an equivalence relation on the integers defined by n is related to m if and only if n minus m is even. Okay, we saw above that this is an equivalence relation. And so, for example, let's look at the equivalence class of 0. So, the equivalence class of 0 is a set of all integers that are related to 0. Now, related to 0 in this case means that x minus 0 is even. And of course, if x minus 0 is even, that just means x is even. So the equivalence class of 0 just consists of all the even integers. So 0, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 6, and so on. Okay. So the equivalence class of 0 for this relation is all even numbers. Next, we could look at the equivalence class of 1. Okay. So that's all integers that are related to 1, that are equivalent to 1. All right? And so that would mean, according to the definition of this particular relation, that that's the set of all integers so that x minus 1 is even. Now if you're off by 1 from an even number, that means that you're an odd number. So this is actually the set of all odd numbers, odd integers. So the equivalent class of 1 is plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 5, and so on. Okay. And it would be a really great exercise uh, for you to do to calculate the equivalence class of 2, the equivalence class of 3, and so on. All right? uh, the next theorem will save you a lot of work in that respect because it will um, show you how you can get from one equivalence class to another easily. So here's a theorem about the nice properties of equivalence classes. Let's let A be a set with an equivalence relation. So the first thing in this theorem says that for any element A in the set A, A is a member of its own equivalence class. Secondly, if A is a member of the equivalence class of B, then B is a member of the equivalence class of A. Thirdly, if A is a member of the equivalence class of B, then actually the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B. And finally, if two equivalence classes have non-empty intersection, then they're actually equal. All right. So let's prove this theorem. So assume we have an equivalence relation on the set A. So step one, we'll prove that for any element A and A, 
um, A is in its own equivalence class. So recall that the equivalence class of A is simply the set of all x in A, so that x is equivalent to A, or x is related to A. Um, to say that A is an element of the equivalence class of A is to say that A is related to A, right? or A is equivalent to A. But of course, this is an equivalence relation. And since it's an equivalence relation, we know that it's reflexive. And that means that if A is an element of the set big A, then A is indeed related to A. Okay, so that exactly means that A is an element of its own equivalence class. Okay, so we've proved the first part of the theorem that for any element A in the set big A, A is a member of its own equivalence class. All right, and that relies on the reflexivity of equivalence relation. So now let's suppose that A and B are elements of the set A. We want to prove that if A is an element of the equivalence class of B, then B is an element of the equivalence class of A. Okay. Remember, the equivalence class of B is a set of all elements of A that are related to B, Okay, that are equivalent to B here. And the equivalence class of A is the set of all elements of A that are equivalent to little a. So suppose a is an element of the equivalence class of b. All right, that means that a is related to b. But this is an equivalence relation again, so it's symmetric. And that means that b is related to a. And if you're related to a, that means that you are in the equivalence class of a. So it follows that b is in the equivalence class of a. Here we're going to prove in step three that if A is an element of the equivalence class of B, then the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B. All right. Now, let's suppose that A is an element of the equivalence class of B. Here we have to show that A, the equivalence class of A is a subset of the equivalence class of B, okay, because these are sets of elements from A, they're subsets of A. And to show set equality, we have to show the inclusion relation holds in both directions. So we have to show that the equivalence class of A is a subset of the equivalence class of B, and the equivalence class of B is a subset of the equivalence class of A. Okay, so let's first prove that the equivalence class of A is a subset of the equivalence class of B, under the assumption that A is an element of the equivalence class of B. All right, so to prove this, we have to show if X is an element of the equivalence class of A, then it's an element of the equivalence class of B. So let's let x be an element of the equivalence class of A. That means that x is equivalent to A. We know that A is an element of the equivalence class of B, so A is equivalent to B. And we know this is an equivalence relation, which is transitive, so if x is equivalent to A, and A is equivalent to B, then x is equivalent to B. So x is an element of the equivalence class of B. So we've just proved that if x is an element of the equivalence class of A, then it's an element of the equivalence class of B. All right, so that means that the equivalence class of A is a subset of the equivalence class of B. Great, now let's prove that the equivalence class of B is a subset of the equivalence class of A. We'll start by supposing that we have an element x in the equivalence class of B. So that means x is related to B, x is equivalent to B. Okay, but we know that A is an element of the equivalence class of B, so A is related to B. So we have X is related to B and A is related to B. Okay, by symmetry of the equivalence relation, A related to B means B is related to A. Okay, or A equivalent to B means B is equivalent to A. Okay, so by transitivity of the relation, if X is related to B and B is related to A, then X is related to A. And so it follows that x is an element of the equivalence class of A. So the equivalence class of B is indeed a subset of the equivalence class of A, because if x is in the equivalence class of B, then x is in the equivalence class of A. Okay. So here we're going to prove that if the intersection of the equivalence classes of A and B are non-empty, then the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B.
So let a and b be elements of a, and let's suppose that the intersection of the equivalence classes of a and b is non-empty. Since that intersection is non-empty, we know that there's some element in there, there's something in it, so let's call it c. So we'll say c is in the intersection. Okay, so c is an element of the equivalence class of a and an element of the equivalence class of b. But we know by part three, c in the equivalence class of a implies that the equivalence class of c equals the equivalence class of a. And also, c is an element of the equivalence class of b, so the equivalence class of c is equal to the equivalence class of b. And of course, by transitivity of equality, that means the equivalence class of a is equal to the equivalence class of b, because they're both equal to the equivalence class of c. All right. So that completes the proof of the theorem. Let's look at an example. Okay, um, Our previous example, this relation defined on the integers by n is related to m if and only if n minus m is even. We proved previously that this is an equivalence relation. We showed that it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And we looked at the equivalence classes um, of this relation. So the equivalence class of 0 is all the even numbers. The equivalence class of 1 is all the odd numbers. And so let's just look at what that theorem that we just proved says in terms of this particular equivalence relation and the equivalence classes here. Part one of our theorem said that if A is an element of A, then A is in its own equivalence class. And here notice that that's confirmed by this example. Zero is an element of the equivalence class of zero, and one is an element of the equivalence class of one. Part two of our theorem said that if A is an element of the equivalence class of B, then B is an element of the equivalence class of A. Okay. So for example, here if you look at the equivalence class of 0, you see that 2 is an element of the equivalence class of 0. So you know that 0 is going to be an element of the equivalence class of 2 by the theorem. All right. And if you were to compute the equivalence class of 2 by hand, you would see the equivalence class of 2 is also all the even numbers. Similarly, since negative 3 is an element of the equivalence class of 1, if you wrote out what the equivalence class of negative 3 is, then you'd see that 1 is an element of that equivalence class. Okay, part 3 of our theorem said that if A is an element of the equivalence class of B, then the equi equivalence class of A is equal to the equi equivalence class of B. All right, so here that means that 0, the equivalence class of 0 is equal to the equivalence class of every integer in that set. So equivalence class of 0 is equal to the equivalence class of 2 and the equivalence class of negative 2. It's equal to the equivalence class of 4 and negative 4 and so on. Okay. Similarly, the equivalence class of 1 is equal to the equivalence classes of negative 1, 3, negative 3, 5, and so on. Okay. So in that sense, there real, really are only two equivalence classes. This relation um, partitions the integers into two equivalence classes. Um, the equivalence class of 0 and the equivalence class of 1. All right. Now, it would e be equally correct to say that there are only two equivalence classes, the equivalence class of 2 and the equivalence class of 3. It doesn't matter, right? They're the same sets. It just depends on what you name them. Okay, finally, part 4 of our theorem said that if the intersection of two equivalence classes is not empty, then they're equal. And here, notice the contrapositive of that is true. Um, the equivalence class of 0 is not equal to the equivalence class of 1. All right, so there are elements of one set that are not elements of the other set. And you can see that in this case, the intersection of the equivalence classes is empty. So part 4 of our theorem uh, is here you see an instance of it. In particular, you see an instance of the contrapositive of that statement. So that's it for this video. Thanks for listening.